Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. It's been such a long time since when I've gotten the chance to say this. I've not done a sit down video in probably two or three months now. And this is the longest I've gone without filming a sit down video. So I'm super, super excited. And today's video is about busting myths. So as the name suggests, there are a lot of myths surrounding, you know, our international medical graduates journey to the UK and moving here, the life here, the work here and everything surrounding that. But I've heard all of these myths while I was planning the journey of moving to the UK. People said a lot of absurd things to me, but I did not believe in any of that things they were saying because I wanted to judge it for myself. So I get a lot of DMs where people have a lot of misconceptions about the life in the UK, the process of moving here and working in the NHS and the lifestyle and everything surrounding that and the money and the salary. So I had asked actually a question, I think two or three months back on my Instagram stories that I'm planning on filming this video where I want to bust the myths surrounding PLAB exams. But what I got a lot of other misconceptions surrounding not just PLAB but the visa process, the life in the UK, job opportunities, training. So what I got was probably hundreds and hundreds of questions in that Instagram story and I cannot answer all of them and a lot of them were repetitive. So I have picked 70 misconceptions, 70 myths that you guys have sent to me. Some of them are actually true so I'm going to address them based on true or false and that's how you're going to see it on the screen. I've got my laptop here with me and I've sat down here on the floor and and I'm gonna get cracking with these 70 myths. So the way I've divided this is that a couple of topics are in the part one of the video and a couple of topics are in part two of the video. So the part one of the video, which is today's video, is gonna have myths surrounding PLAB exams, visa, racism, bullying, discrimination, money, yeah, so that's going to be all in part one of the video. And the part two of the video is going to have job, training, NHS, and just general life in the UK. So I'm not going to waste any more time and get cracking with the myths. And also if you guys are new to my channel, then welcome to my channel. We recently crossed 23,000 subscribers. I still cannot believe that. And I'm a little rusty currently getting back to these sit down videos. So if you notice that I'm fumbling a lot, making a lot of grammatical errors, or I seem a little nervous, that's because I've not made one of these videos in a very long time. So please, please, please be kind to me. And if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, then please do. And yeah, so without wasting any more time let's get cracking with the video so the first topic is PLAB exams. The first thing that someone's asked me is, you have to work really hard from your college days to get into countries like USA and UK. I mean, that's such a subjective thing to say, what does really hard mean? Uh, but without being diplomatic, I'm just going to say, I, I just really need to not have any filters and be very honest. So I'm just going to say no. You don't have to work really, really hard wherein you're getting these distinctions or gold medals in your medical school. And if you don't get it, and then you can't have this dream of moving out of India or moving to the UK. I can't speak for USA because I haven't given the USMLE exams. But from what I've heard is that USMLE exams are quite difficult. But having said that you don't have to be performing exceedingly well in your MBBS exams in India for you to have this dream of moving to the UK or USA. This whole myth that has been going on for generations together from I don't know parents generations to our grandparents generations wherein they tell you that if you don't work hard then you cannot have these dreams of moving abroad to any other country outside of India. So yeah so I'm just gonna uh, I need to keep it very precise so no that's a false. Next Next myth is you can either appear for PLAB exams or need PG exams but not both. Completely false again. If you want to keep your options open then you should. If you want to appear for NEET exams and for PLAB exams at the same time you can do that. You can appear for your PLAB exams during your internship days as well. You want to go ahead and give both exams. You want to go ahead and give three exams with USMLE or a fourth exam for, for the AMC which is Australian Medical Council. You can do whatever you want to. This is all a myth that you can either appear for one or the other. You can appear for as many exams that you want to. Can't give PLAB if we didn't do MBBS in reputed medical college. 
I again don't know what you mean by reputed medical college because in India there's this concept that if you do it from a government medical college that is reputed and if you do from a private it's not reputed so if that's what you mean then that's not true I again don't know what you mean by reputed medical college you just have to make sure that your college needs to be in the dictionary which is recognized by the GMC when you're applying for lab exams other than that it doesn't matter where you do your MBBS from back in any subject during MBBS will affect your resume for lab those of you who are not from India when someone saying back they mean that if you failed a subject in your MBBS days and you've got a backlog and you have to clear it in the subsequent years I think this person means that if you get that during MBBS then this will affect your resume for lab not at all when you are post your lab exams when you get your GMC license and you start applying for jobs they do not ask you if you how many years it's taken for you in the sense that how many subjects you've got backlog in or what was your percentage in your MBBS days only if you've gotten like a gold medal or your distinction then you're going to put it on your resume if you haven't then no one's going to ask about that that how many attempts it took for you to clear your MBBS exams next if you have two gap years post MBBS in India then you won't be able to find jobs in the UK false again I had two years or a little more than two years by the time I joined yeah it was definitely more than two years 2015 uh, 2016 I'm so lost right now I think it was 2016 um, is when I finished yes my internship I started working in January 2019 so that's way beyond two years so this is completely false so if you have gap years beyond two years post your MBBS then also it doesn't matter because I'm clearly working over here so here goes your example but what I want to say here and I keep getting these questions and I want to stress again just deviating from the busting myths topic is that if you have gap years it's completely fine you're a human you're going to take a break here and there or you're going to change your route and give other exams or have, have other plans in place just be able to explain that whenever you're applying for your GMC registration don't lie if you're taking a break and traveling say that if you are taking a break to give other exams then be honest and say that if you had some personal reasons some family issues or for any other reasons for your mental health if you've taken a gap or taken a break or if you want a maternity leave and you are having kids completely fine so just be honest about it don't worry about the gap years just be able to explain it and have proof as to what you were doing during those gap years lab is a very costly exam okay I'm going to be very honest if you obviously compare it to the entrance exams in India then it is expensive but having said that once you start working in the UK you earn that money back very quickly. PLAB compared to USMLE is much cheaper but it's so easy for me to say these things and I completely acknowledge that I come from a privileged background where my parents paid for my PLAB exam so I didn't have to work towards it or save it. So if you're somebody who is financially independent post MBBS or for that and you're working towards saving your money to give PLAB exams then it's completely doable because I have a friend currently in India who's working and saving the money to give PLAB exams. It is costly and middle class people can't afford. Like now, we have to see dreams according to budget. I come from middle class family. Both my parents were working. Uh, my mom is just going to retire now. My dad was working until his retirement in a government medical hospital. So I don't come from a background wherein when I say privilege, I mean that I was given a chance to, you know, have my own education and I was given a chance to follow my dreams of moving to the UK. So that's what I mean by privilege. When I say that, I don't mean that my parents have a hospital or something and you know I have a hospital to go back to in India or you know they were working in private sector where they've got like bucket loads of money and all that that's all what I mean by privilege I mean by privilege that I had opportunities to follow these dreams so I am from a middle class background working class middle class background in India so no it's false that middle class people cannot afford it costs tons of money again I've addressed that it does cost money but lab 2 slots are very less and are booked for the whole year someone else said due to competition we are not able to book exams and duration of years increase to reach UK first of all if you're trying the lab journey for the first time then it can be a bit of a shock that the seats get taken away very quickly what you need to remember is that the journey is long and you might not have seats available when you're looking for it and you have to be really patient I started my lab journey in April 2017 and my first day on the job was in January 2019 so it took me almost two years to go through the entire journey and sometimes that was because there were no seats available for PLAB 1 in India they were getting quickly booked and things like that and obviously now you've got the whole COVID into the mix so that makes it 
even more difficult that they have lesser seats or lesser availabilities or they're trying to clear off the backlog wherein people who had booked before are being given the first chance and things like that. So it can be a little stressful because you've made this decision and you want to get over with it quickly and you want to move here and start working and that's how I felt as well. So I just want to validate if you're feeling that way because I did go through the same feeling, these emotions where I'm like, I know what I want to do now, but why? can I not do it sooner and why is it taking so long why do I have to go through this entire process but now looking back it's 2022 looking back to four five years back oh my god it's been actually five years looking back to five years back when I decided in 2017 is when I decided 2019 is when I moved three years back you kind of forget all of that struggle but in that moment I 100% understand that it feels really frustrating but honestly it will pass you just have to be patient and sometimes you feel like oh, you know what I can't be bothered it's just taking too long don't give up so soon just because there are no seats available be patient be focused having said that have other plans in the time being don't stop living your life like if you want to take the time out to spend some time with your family do that you want to travel with your friends do that you want to work somewhere in a hospital do that do what you can in those few years while you're going through your lab journey it might look to someone else that you're just living your life not really you know working 24 7 towards this dream of moving to the uk that's how it might look to others and that's how it looked to other people around me as well but I knew what I was up to I was constantly looking up for information I was constantly doing my research as to what's going to happen next so just be focused let the background noise be background noise I know that wasn't the question but yeah you just have to be patient this has been an issue for many many years so this is not something new but obviously it's gotten worse now and that I think is because of the pandemic I could be completely wrong blab is easy but heard that Britishers won't allow IMGs to reach consultant position easily so the first part of the myth is correct plab is easy but heard that Britishers won't allow IMGs to reach consultant position easily I mean I've heard this quite a lot and this is something I'd heard even before I moved to the UK that you know British trainees and British registrars are going to be preferred over an IMG so if you mean that if someone has done their PG from India and then they're going to come here and apply for a consultant position then you are right they will not uh, prefer an IMG over a British trainee say if someone did their PG in psychiatry from India gave the Royal College exams and came over here and then was applying for a specialty training position like I would be so when I apply for my ST4 job someone else from India would be also applying for the higher training job they would prefer a British trainee and I get included in that because I've done my core training from here they have every right to do that because these people including me we've trained here we know the system better than someone who's trained outside of the country but if you get to the consultant job obviously I have not applied for a consultant job because I'm not a consultant yet i'm not too comfortable answering this because i haven't applied for a consultant position but if you say that they won't allow imgs to reach consultant position easily that's absolutely false everybody goes through the same training process you do your core training you do your specialty training which is a higher training and then you become a consultant it's got nothing to do with a british or non-british progressing to become a consultant so that's absolutely false uh, passing plap is not enough to get a job you have to wait for two to three years you are in a queue passing plap is not enough to get a job is false once you get past your plab exams you get your gmc registration so you're going to get a job if you apply and do your well in your interview and all that you have to wait for two to three years i honestly haven't come across someone who's passed their plab exams and had to wait for three years to get a job they could have been doing something else in those three years but if you're telling me they had to keep applying for jobs in those three years and not get a job then i would say that that person needs to really look into their cv and see what is going wrong or like really take a step back and assess that what is going wrong in their interviews three years is a really long time i haven't ever ever heard that i gave with a bunch of international medical graduates when i was giving my plav exams in 2018 and a lot of them were from various different countries i haven't encountered that wherein someone had to wait for three years within like i think six to eight months most of us i was in touch with a lot of them i still am in touch with a lot of them got the job so no you're not in a queue that's false in a few years or so it would be very difficult to land even an fy2 job due to increasing influx of imgs i don't know what the influx rate is of imgs but i've always said this to people that you know even when i was applying in 2017 18 for these flap exams everybody told me that oh you know uk is saturated with doctors you're not going to be able to do this probably assess your plan and think of us or australia and i said that unless i try it i wouldn't know so someone who's not even doing this journey basically all these seniors and people from india all these uncles and all that aunties and all that who aren't
and even in the journey that I am in are giving me these advices. They, they don't live here. They've not gone through this journey and giving me all these unsolicited advice. So I just completely, you know, blocked all of these things out of my head. And I said that if I don't land a job, say after this period of time, then probably I'll reassess that, oh, maybe there is a saturation, but that's not the case. There's so many vacancies. Like if you go on NHS jobs website, if you go on track jobs, there's so many vacancies and every August and every February, there's an intake of trainees for core training and higher training. So no, there is no saturation that's going on. And I can't predict what's hap going to happen in a few years. Like in 2017, people said it's saturated. It's 2022. And I can currently say it's not saturated. So yeah, please don't listen to all these people. The exams for PG or training at after PLAB are very difficult to crack and you cannot get into PG or training. We have to give a lot of tough exams to get into residency. It's hard, especially the specialty training exams. Residency exams after PLAB are more tough than USMLE. So more or less about, you know, the higher training exams and everything. It's not difficult to crack these exams to get into core training, first of all, because you have to give MSRA exams. And if you prepare for them for a few months, you're going to be completely fine. And then you're going to have the interview. So you have to do well in the MSRA exams and the interview, and you need to have a good portfolio to get into core training. So I would say false. These exams are not difficult. But the exams that come within your core training are your Royal College exams. So like you would have heard MRC Psych, MRC OG, MRCP, MRCPH, MRC GP. So all of these Royal College exams definitely are difficult. And every specialty has different number of exams. Like in MRC Psychiatry, we have three parts. So we have Paper A, Paper B and the CASC exam, which is the OSCE exam. These exams can be difficult. A lot of graduates in India can also be appearing for these exams exams if they qualify the criteria wherein like you know they've got these set number of years where they've been specializing in the specialty they are giving these royal college exams in so these exams are difficult i won't deny that are they as difficult as usmle i can't comment because i'm not someone who's prepared for usmle so someone who's taken both the usmle and the royal college exams probably they can comment on it but what i can say is that are these exams doable 100 percent yes because there's so many imgs that i'm friends with who are in my trust or outside out of my trust who are giving these exams who have given these exams who've passed these exams but i would say that it does get competitive if you're trying to get into training in the uk it's okay to do plab and then get a non-training job but if it's you know specialty training or higher training is what you're aiming for then it can get competitive but then you know what are the things they're looking for so then you kind of do those things what they're looking for and i've made this entire video on what i did on my portfolio when i was applying for co-training in psychiatry and how i got into another trust in london so i'm going to link that video up over here shameless plug you can go and watch that. I've in detail explained the process, the exams, what to study, where to study from, what was in my portfolio, what happened in the interview and everything. So please go ahead and watch this video. So those are all the PLAB myths. If you have any more PLAB myths, then feel free to drop it down in my comments below. I'm going to move on very swiftly to the next topic, which is visa. So the first thing that someone sent in is it's almost impossible to get PLAB2 visa to write PLAB2 exam for a middle class person. Completely false again. It's very straightforward and it's very self-explanatory to apply for PLAB2 visa which is the tourist visa. I have made a entire in-depth detailed video about it which i'm going to link up over here so if you got any questions you can go and watch this video very straightforward completely false so okay so the next one is immigrants don't get pr which is permanent residency i'm assuming in uk for many years yeah you don't get it for many years because there are a number of years that you need to live in the country and satisfy the criteria before you apply for permanent residency the way it works is that you need to be on a tier 2 visa which you would be once you give your plap exams and you get your gmc license and you move here so you need to be for five years in the country before you apply for ila which is indefinite leave to remain and you need to be on ila for a year and then you apply for your british passport but it's not as straightforward as this is because you need to be a set number of days in the country the set number of days you cannot be outside of UK per year and in the ILR period it's much more lesser there's an exam and everything that you need to give once you are applying for British passport and all that this is false 
we do get a PR. It's very straightforward. Five years onto your two visa, then ILR, and then you get your British passport. The next is I have heard you cannot get UK citizenship if you do a GP course. You have to go back to your country. What does GP course have to do with someone getting UK citizenship? And why are you differentiating? GPs are amazing. It's an amazing training to do. Absolutely false. UK doesn't give visa for permanent residents for India. There's no use of practicing there in the UK if you can't stay. Absolutely false. There's so many IMG doctors who are from India and now have British passport. Completely false again. I have heard UK doesn't give citizenship even after eight years. False again. Like I said, five years, one year, and then you apply for British passport. Obviously, someone can be on ILR for a longer period and maybe that's why they haven't applied for UK passport because they aren't eligible yet because like I said you need to be for a set number of days in the UK and cannot exit the country during your ILR period for more than those days so yeah maybe that's why this person didn't get it after eight years but they would have gotten ILR by then if they've been on tier 2 visa for five years so that's all about the visa bit racism bullying and discrimination racism there is a lot of discrimination in the uk people discriminate with indians in the uk i'm going to try and be as sensitive to this topic as possible so there are two ways to be talking about it and i'm hopefully going to address both the ways i haven't experienced in my face racism at work ever in my three years it's never happened wherein i have felt like someone is being racist to me other than sometimes patients can be but not any of my colleagues i haven't seen it with my eyes even at work i haven't seen someone be racist to someone else i have never ever ever seen that i worked in only two trusts one was in southern and one is now in london but having said that just because i haven't experienced it that doesn't mean it is not out there i do read about it in the news i do see social media posts and the reason why i want to be saying that is because just because i've not seen it or i have not experienced it that doesn't mean someone else is not going through it i don't want to minimize anybody else's i'm sure it happens the reason why i'm saying i'm sure it happens is because unfortunately we just live in a world where people probably can't be kind to one another and having said that it's not just in the uk there is racism in india as well there's racism in so many other countries but if i would have thought about all of these factors thinking that oh there can be racism in the uk or this can happen or that can happen I didn't want to let all of these factors influence or decide my journey because I know this is something I can experience back in India as well so you need to decide this for yourself you need to have all your information in place you can have any of these encounters which are not very nice anywhere in the world and that's because as humans we are all not kind to one another so that's where i'm going to leave that the next is racism they don't let imgs flourish in administrative positions i think this is true i would say and that would be because i have seen that and it's not just imgs it's even women i would say that in all of these big administrative positions you kind of see a lot of men a lot of white people and not people of color so we need more of that representation presentation in these high administrative positions 100 percent the next one is basically there's a lot of racism patients not wanting treatment from indian doctors okay i did say this before that you know obviously sometimes patients have been racist to me it's not happened like every single day of the last two and plus years or something it's i think there have been only two instances it's not just me a lot of oriental asian doctors have also experienced that black people have also experienced that so it's not particularly aimed at Indian doctors like a patient is going to be racist and say that oh I don't want to be seen by an Indian doctor have heard that that has happened one of my friends said that okay so the next topic which is the final one for this part one of the video is money you won't have enough money to survive on your own when you first move there unless you have relatives so this is false you won't have money to survive on your own you obviously are not going to move to the uk with a completely zero bank balance you're going to move here with some money for the first one month till your salary comes in you don't need to have relatives here but if you you just need to have a little bit of bank balance to move to the uk so that you can just afford a few things for the first few weeks or month till you get your salary 
Halloween. So I borrowed some money from my parents for the first one month when I moved over here. And then once my salary came in, been independent ever since. I don't have relatives here. I didn't know anyone in the UK as family when I moved over here. I obviously knew a few of my seniors who were living over here, but I didn't move into the same city as them. So no, you don't need to have any relatives to survive here in the first few months. Next one is you don't make much money in the UK. This is something that a lot of people DM me, comment on my videos. I don't know what much money means to you. Your vocabulary of much money can be very different to my vocabulary of much money. I think for the hours we work here in the UK as a junior doctor, I think we get paid good enough. But having said that, I think doctors anywhere in the world don't get paid as much as they should be, as in they deserve much more. They put in so many hours, the kind of years that go into training and studying and giving exams and all that. I think doctors everywhere in the world, whether it's UK, US, Australia, India, Pakistan, anywhere, deserve much more, much more money than we get paid. Like I have a friend over here who works in Facebook or Meta now and her partner works in Google and the kind of money they make, I'm sure is much more than the money I make, but the kind of hours I put in are ridiculous and the kind of risk and everything that comes with our job. I don't know what you mean. Like I live a very, very touch wood. I have a very fulfilled and satisfied life with the kind of salary I get. But then if you give me a choice to be earning more, obviously I'm going to be saying yes. But yeah, the money over here is much more, I would say, compared to the money I would have been earning doing my residency in India. So next one is, you can't save money as it's very expensive. You can't save much because salary is less and living is expensive. It's very difficult to save money in the UK. First of all, UK is expensive. I'm not going to deny that. It's very, very expensive. And especially if you're living in London, oh my god it's shit expensive living in london but having said that you obviously need to find your ways to save money i don't mean that you're going to deprive yourself of having a good life you can save money i've been working for three years now and i have made investments i have saved enough i have not enough but i obviously want to save more to be able to finally buy a house but i have savings i can afford to travel i can afford to spoil myself i can afford to buy things for my partner for my mother and for my sister it's completely false when people say that you can't save money so i I would say this is false but i would say it's true that it is expensive you are living in a first world developed country so the lifestyle is going to be expensive and it is sort of expensive anywhere in the world if you compare it to india i think it's a difference in the currency so everything if you're going to convert everything you will obviously feel that oh my god that's so expensive it's so much cheaper in india but then you compare the salary you i think it's a false when people say you can't save that's a false next is doctors in the uk earn way less than they earn in the usa Salary is very low as compared to USMLE plus training is too long, seven to eight years. Okay, I don't know the salary in the USA, but I have heard that the salary in USA is higher than the salary in the UK. Yeah, I agree with you that doctors do get paid much higher in the USA and the salary compared to USA is lower for the doctors over here. But then you also need to realize that the hours that we have, which is like the working hours and residency and all of that is much lesser than the ones in USA. Like USA, the residency is very hectic it's very compact in three years okay next one is one shouldn't expect to be rich if they want to be a doctor in the uk well one shouldn't expect to be rich if you're a doctor anywhere in the world to be honest if you want to be rich please don't become a doctor the kind of years that go into becoming a consultant the money that we spend giving exams paying for medical school and all the loan and everything that comes with it if you want to become a doctor please don't associate doctor with becoming rich please Please pick another profession. Any other profession other than doctor will pay you much higher. For the longest time, I have heard that there are tuition fees in the UK for residency. This is false. There's no tuition fees for doing your training over here in the UK. You have to pay college fees for PG in the UK. This is false again. By PG, if you mean co-training and higher training or your foundation training, you don't pay fees for any of this. You rather get paid because you're working as a doctor. So yeah, so these were all the myths for the part one of the video. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video if you did then you know the drill do give it a big thumbs up and if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel then please do and if you have any other you know doubts or misconceptions or myths surrounding these topics then do drop it down in the comment section below and i'll probably make a part three of this video have to wait for the next few days for the part two of this video to come out which has even more interesting myths that i'm going to bust but yeah i'm going to leave this video off over here hope you're looking after yourself taking care of yourself and your loved ones and i'll see you in the next video bye Mwah.